A typical day in the ER is not really that typical because it's always, it's different. Everything's different every day. Granted, you'll see similar scenarios, but each person's different. So you have the non-critical to the extreme critical. For example, I'll, I'll get a guy with, with a laceration. I will clean it up and the doctor will stitch it up. Nice. Or someone will come in with abdominal pain. I'll put an IV line up, get their blood work, start IV fluids, and give them pain medication to get them comfortable. Or a guy will come in with complete cardiac arrest. The whole team is inside the, the resuscitation room and we're pumping, we're pushing medications, we're putting IV lines and shocking the patient, seeing if we'll bring them back to life. Sometimes it's successful, sometimes it's not. I was awakened from what I thought was a dream by my nurse. A beautiful woman with the softest hands I'd ever felt. Como te sientes? She said in Spanish. I feel fine, I replied. At least I thought I was feeling fine at the moment. However, I wasn't sure how I got in the hospital. The last thing I remember was being at work at the prison. Looking up at her, I said, why am I here? There was a riot at the prison and you were injured. You don't remember anything? Scratching my head, I thought, I remember yesterday morning. I remember having lunch, chicken quesadillas my girlfriend had prepared. But that was it. Lying there, I could even visualize the faces of the men I worked with, but I couldn't quite remember their names. You know that feeling you have when the word you're looking for is right on the edge of your tongue, but you just can't remember it? That's exactly how I was feeling about everything. Also, just beneath it, there was something else. This overwhelming sense of fear, like something had gone terribly wrong. Part of me wanted to get out of the hospital bed and run as far away as I could, but I didn't know why. When I went to move my right leg, Oh my God, the pain. Looking down, I had stitches from my inner thigh clear around to the other side of my leg. And as hard as I tried, I couldn't remember what happened to me. I looked up at the nurse and said, what is wrong with my leg? She went on explaining to me that I had deep lacerations and had lost a lot of pints of blood. Then she looked me square in the eye and said, sir, you're lucky to be alive. Little did I know at that moment that things were about to get a lot worse. She then told me my family was eager to see me, but before she could let them in, there were some men that I needed to talk to. Tell them everything you know, she said, and things will be just fine. As soon as they're done, you can see your family. Now at this time, I'm at a complete loss. Men from where? Maybe my... What happened? Ten minutes later, she walked back into the room with two men. One gently touched her on the arm and smiled just before she walked out of the door. They exchanged this glance that was not one of people who are strangers, but a glance of someone who knew each other. At that moment, it didn't make sense, but I did notice it. One was a very tall black man, lean and muscular. Another one was this short, pudgy white fellow. The black guy wore black dress slacks, a vest, and a white shirt. No tie, no jacket. It seemed as if he had been waiting so long that he decided to take off the rest of his clothes. The white guy was wearing a button-up Guayavera. He still had crust in his eyes, like he had just woken up and rushed out of the house or something. Now these two men, they were intense. They had this look about them, like they had seen it all. And this eerie calm to them, like nothing I've ever felt. When you know there's something bubbling just under the surface, that's what I felt with them. The black guy started off by saying, the black guy started off by saying, do you remember anything from the prison riot? How did it start? Honestly, at that moment, I couldn't remember anything. Then he opened up a folder. He began to read out loud my life stories. He had information about me, my parents, my brother, how long I've been down in South America, all the way down to my ex-girlfriend's name, and that she left me for an American, got her green card, then divorced him. Then he handed me this brown envelope. said, take a look at these and see what you can remember. Oh my God, the images that I saw, something from a slaughterhouse, severed limbs, decapitated bodies, blood splattered all over the walls. Instantly, my stomach began to turn and my esophagus filled as I felt nauseous. Do you remember any of this? What happened? He started to press me. But again, apart from the fact that I was about to vomit, 
I wasn't sure what the hell he was talking about. The only thing that felt real to me at this moment was that these two men were strangers who clearly worked for some other government than mine and were drilling me. After about a solid 30 minutes of questioning, they both got up and walked out, leaving me feeling relieved and also wondering why. Why are they here? Why would they be over a prison ride? A few minutes later, the pain in my leg became unbearable. So I sent the nurse and she gave me a sedative that put me straight to sleep. I woke the next morning and my father was at my bedside. Dad looked worried. He went on to explain to me that two men had come to the house and asked him questions about me and my job. In the first 60 seconds, I knew exactly who he was talking about. I realized it was the same two men who had visited me in the hospital just yesterday. This had to be serious. So my father left. I sat there in silence, trying to remember what happened that day. Slowly things started coming back to me. I remember walking the fences that morning while the prisoners were on the yard. And two of the inmates talking about Perez de Guerra, or dogs of war. They said they had saw them. That day all the convicts were talking about the same thing. That one memory opened the floodgates to the rest of my memories. The night guards had been talking about seeing large black dogs outside of the gates of the prison at night. So large that they were afraid to shoot. That evening, while I was making my rounds around the inner gate, I went to hell in a handbasket as one of the tower guards decided to take a shot at a smaller black dog. Before you knew it, they were rushing the fences. I saw one of them stand up on his two hind legs. This thing was massive. Within seconds, they had broken down the gates and were flooding into the compound. I turned and ran to cell block C. I just opened the door. I felt a sharp pain on my right leg. I felt like I had been tackled by something huge. A body flew hitting the nearby metal stairway. As I lay there in pain, I saw these dogs coming into the cell block. Some on all fours, others walking upright. I remember my friend Pedro firing shots at one of them before taking off running. Somehow the prisoners got out of their cells. Vision grew dark quickly. So if someone was turning out the light, that was all I could remember. Later that night, the two men returned and questioned me again. I told them what I saw, but I didn't know exactly what it was. I think it was best to say that I couldn't remember, but I did. I remembered everything. Then a few days later, I was released from the hospital and allowed to go home. The only problem was that my muscle tissues were so damaged that I was forced to use a wheelchair. My girlfriend Liliana rode me out of the hospital, and as we got to the car, those two guys walked up on me again. They had harassed and questioned me so much while I was in the hospital, but they refused to give me their names. So I decided to name them myself. Mikey was a white guy, and Ricky was a black guy. There was no way in the world I was going to one-up these guys, but at least mentally I could. In my mind, it was a way of getting revenge against these two strangers who, who knew everything about me, but I knew absolutely nothing about them. This visit was just like all the others. They didn't warn anything. I had answered all their questions. They were just there to threaten me. We'll be watching you, Ricky said. And I was in real pain. And I had answered all their questions. And you reach a point where you just don't give a damn anymore. That's when I told Ricky, if these things are so important to you, then why are you harassing me and the people I work with? Why don't you go out and find them? When I made that comment, he gave me this look. You know that look, I'll kill you. And then they walked off. Things were quiet when I got home. My girlfriend had taken a week off work to tend to my injuries. For the most part, I was drugged up all day. However, the second week, she had to return to work. And that's when all the crazy stuff started to happen. Liliana works at night and sleeps most of the day. So she was doing her best to take care of me. But there's only so much one person can do. The craziness started off as I would have nightmares of these creatures visiting my house. Stuff like them watching Liliana leave to go to work. In my nightmares, I could see through their eyes. Talk about some freaky stuff. I could see them running through the woods, night and day. In my dreams, they would be right behind a set of trees, watching kids play soccer, or up high in a tree watching someone walk out of their front door. It was almost like when I went to sleep, I could see through their eyes. And these dreams went on for a few weeks. Then, during one of the dreams, I was watching as one of these creatures was chasing a deer, and it suddenly stopped, turned, and ran for miles and miles. Eventually, it ended up standing at the back door to my house. And I was able to wake myself from this nightmare. So I got up, drank some water, and then went back to bed. And that was my last dream I had about them. But it was only the beginning of my lessons about these creatures. About a day or so after I had that last dream, I was in my wheelchair maneuvering around the sofa when I passed the back door. 
for some reason something told me to open it up and when I did I saw these huge canine prints in the mud right at my back door our backyards are not like what you consider a yard in the US there's no fence or gate it's just a clearing that eventually leads to the woods these prints led back to the wood line finding these prints completely freaked me out because at this point in time I hadn't seen these creatures since the incident at the prison and I had spoken to several of my co-workers who said they were still seeing them in the area. But this prison is only nine miles away from my house. And that's if you take the roads. It's more like five miles away if you drew a straight line through the woods. That's when I began to panic and wonder, had my dreams led them to me? Were they coming to kill me? The only thing I could think to do was share this with my father. And he decided that we should see Amachi, a healer and a spiritual guide. So my father reaches out to a friend who knows Amachi. But she said she couldn't come to my aid immediately. That I would have to wait out the wolf. Wait out the wolf? I told my father, what the hell is she talking about? Over the next few days, the term waiting out the wolf will come to light. I started to see them. These creatures were just standing in the wood line near my house. And in the morning time, I could find prints outside my windows. This all came to a head one night when I finally had enough. I rolled to the back door of my wheelchair and opened it up. And as I struggled to stand up, one of them came rushing towards me. This thing ended up being like three feet away from me. And it looked me dead in my eyes. Now I was scared when they broke into the prison. But this type of fear, I had never felt. It was almost as if this thing wanted me to be afraid of it. Like it was instilling fear into my very soul. This staring match only lasted about three seconds. As I couldn't keep my eyes locked on it. Because to be honest with you, I couldn't look this thing in his eyes. The only thing I could do was look down at the ground. Then it turned and walked away. And also, I didn't realize until I sat back down in my wheelchair, but I pissed myself. The way I felt at that moment was drained, but not drained like I was tired, but drained of all courage and strength. I sat there behind that closed door with piss all over the floor and all over my pants, and I cried. It was absolutely nothing I could do to stop these creatures if they wanted to get to me or my girlfriend. And I felt like it wanted me to know that, but why? Why didn't it kill me? That question bugs me to this day. Three days later, Damachi and my father came to the house. She sat there listening to everything that happened to me. And after I told her the complete story, she was quiet for what seemed like 10 minutes. Then she told me I had been mocked by the dogs of war and that it was a great honor. And I'm looking at her like, no, this, no, it's not an honor. She told me I could see through their eyes and had a special connection with them. That warriors of old would have the same connection and use it to summon the dogs of war to fight on their behalf. But me, I didn't want anything to do with these creatures. All I wanted to do was heal up and get back to work. The matcha asked me if I was sure. And then she gave me a necklace and told me to keep it on for seven days. And at the end of the seven days, I was to burn it and my connection with them would be lost forever. On this necklace was a small bag and inside was some fur and a bone. I wore the necklace for the next seven days and then burnt it as she instructed me to but I was still trapped in the house and unable to move. On the eighth day, I constantly looked out of the windows and doors looking for these creatures, but they were nowhere to be found. Talk about being relieved. 30 days later, I was able to return to my job, but things weren't the same. All the prisoners who were in that cell block had been transferred out, and a few guards that had those encounters wouldn't talk about the dogs of war. They pretended like they hadn't seen anything. And as for me, I walk inside and outside the gates, and I haven't seen them once. I know for a fact that they're real and they exist, but I think the Machi has protected me from them. And for that, I'm forever grateful to her. And as for the dogs of war, they ought to be respected and feared. So if you have an encounter with one of these dogs of war at your house or in the woods, whatever you do, don't shoot them. Just turn and walk away and pray that they don't follow you home.